want to welcome everyone to today's presentation, Seamless Santa Cruz, featuring Ian Griffiths. I'm Barry Scott, and I, I live in Aptos, and I'm with the Coast Utura and Coastal Rail Santa Cruz and Friends of the Rail and Trail. And um, I'm really excited to have Ian here. I know Ian from his work with Seamless Bay Area, where, and I'll let him tell you what that's all about, but the the, the wonderfulness of uh, that effort it has to do with the integration of, of various transit systems across the uh, greater Bay Area region. And, uh, and I asked Ian to, to work on uh, what it might look like uh, to have a, a integrated metro, metro network with, with, a rail, with a rail line serving that system. So Ian, tell us about yourself and just take it away, please. Yeah, thanks, Barry, for having me. Um, so, um, I'm the seam, I'm the policy director for a nonprofit called Seamless Bay Area, uh, and Seamless Bay Area's mission is to um, bring about a to transform the the San Francisco Bay Area's uh, fragmented public transit system into a world class, unified, equitable, and widely used network by both building a diverse movement for change and actually. Uh, promoting the policy reforms that can get us there. We focus on the nine county Bay Area primarily, uh, but you know, we also really support um, you know, the, the seamless integration across California, including with the adjacent parts of the Bay Area. And in recent years, we've been getting much more into California-wide issues because these issues don't just end in, in the Bay Area. They, they're, they're certainly a challenge in a lot of different places. Um, and my background prior to founding, co-founding Seamless Bay Area in 2017 and 18, I've worked in public transportation and urban planning for the past 15 years. Um, I went to UC Berkeley. Uh, that's how I ended up in California. I'm from Canada originally, um, moved out here to do my, my master's of city planning at Berkeley, um, lived and worked here as a planner for uh, in, in San Francisco um, for about five years. Then I had the opportunity to actually move back to Canada, moved to Toronto and worked in the public transit sector in the greater Toronto region between 2012 and 2015. And that's really where I became fascinated with um, the policies that can bring about seamless integration because what was going on in Toronto at the time, there was a newly created regional authority called Metrolinx that um, was what had been created to really integrate the entire region's transit um, and lay out a bold and compelling vision for uh, for for the for the more, a more effective transit system across the suburbs and the urban areas and even the outlying um, uh, greater mega region, um, integrating buses and trains, commuter rail service, urban service, wayfinding, fares, all of these different components of the customer experience. I moved back to the Bay Area then in 2015, uh, and I started working at BART actually, and that was really where I saw how challenged the Bay Area was uh, because we didn't have this lead, we didn't have the institutional leadership that was bringing about that clear vision for change, and uh, and then after several years, uh, advocacy became my full my full time work to really bring about those types of changes um, because they're so important for building transit ridership. So. Um, today, I what I would like to, I guess I, I'm gonna. There's kind of two parts of my presentation that I have planned. The first part is to give you a little bit more of an overview of Seamless Bay Area um, and the um, what we support in terms of bringing about a much higher ridership transit system. What what are the aspects of seamless integration? What are the policy policies that bring about that and, and how, we're, how we're working to bring about that type of change, specifically in the Bay Area, but I think a lot of these things are, are, uh, you know, are relevant to Santa Cruz too. And we can take questions if there are any, um, but then the second part of the presentation, uh, we'll be diving into Santa Cruz specifically and what I've been working on uh, after a few meetings with Barry and some other transit advocates in, in uh, Santa Cruz is, uh, a vision map for service in the Santa Cruz region and in, in Santa Cruz County that imagines how a rail system, how uh, you know the, the the beginning of rail service on the Santa Cruz branch 
line could integrate seamlessly with bus service, how uh, we might restructure Metro services so that these two systems work uh, in a complementary, seamless way uh, as one system, because for riders, they don't like Sony, you know, rail, rail needs to be part of that type of network. So I'll share those maps. Uh, I would love feedback. I would love, you know, and, and we'd be happy to take uh, questions or just have a conversation uh, based on, on that, um, based on uh, that material. So with that, I'll jump into the first part of the presentation, unless there's anything else you wanted to say, Barry. No, I just uh, I just want to I want to thank you. I, I will give a heads up to uh, Zenon and Michael and Michael, uh, the, our local UC slugs who were helping uh, us a little bit, and Michael uh, Paisano as well. Uh, we had some uh, so that our our, our guests know uh, we had some local local assistance in this project. So please take it away. Great, and you can. Good, I hope you can hear me. All right, so. Um, I had introduced um, uh, Seamless Bay Area already um, as a nonprofit. And of course, you know, public transit is just so central to so many of Northern California's most pressing challenges. I think, you know, Rod Deardon spoke, you said very a few days ago about how important it is for climate. It's obviously connected so closely to our housing affordability challenges in Northern California. The places, you, the, the number of housing options that you have access to is directly, you know, related to how far you can get to um, using affordable transportation and, and hopefully sustainable transportation. And in the Bay Area, and I think this is largely true in Santa Cruz too, you know, the transit system is not keeping up. Um, we've seen declines in ridership in the Bay Area. I, I've also looked at the Santa Cruz numbers. It's going in a similar direction. All prior to COVID, we were seeing you know, uh, fewer people taking transit overall. Um, we talk a lot to the members of the public all over the region about whether they are interested in using transit. And what we hear over and over is, yes, people do want to use transit. They, they would use it more, but so often it is just not a logical choice for them. It takes too long. It maybe doesn't take people where they need to go. It's not structured in a convenient way for them or it's not reliable enough. Um, and a unique thing in the Bay Area and in the nine county Bay Area, um, and one of the reasons why our fragment, our, our re system is not working is because it is extremely fragmented. We have 27 different transit agencies in the nine county Bay Area, and they carry only five, five to 6% of all trips taken are, are on transit in comparison to 70 or 75% that are taken in cars. And I think that's, that's probably similar for Santa Cruz. I think it's probably transit might be even a little lower than that. Um, and this is much lower than regions around the world that have, you know, comparable density. Even even regions as spread out as as the Bay Area is are do do can do much better. Um, and you know, I think specifically that relevant here is that we have six different six seven different rail systems in the Bay Area, and they're very poorly integrated with the bus systems. And this is this is a unique thing in the Bay Area. It's not particularly unique in the United States, but it is, it is a thing that we keep doing is we create a new rail focused agency just to run the rail service. And we don't uh, do a very good job of, of integrating it with buses. And overall, this is, this is keep holding us back from having you know, a more effective network that takes people from anywhere to anywhere, which might require multiple agencies. You know, there's, there's barriers each time you cross from a different mode or each time you cross to a different agency of separate maps, separate schedules, uh, different fare structures, Sometimes it can be very unfair that you end up paying more for taking transit, which should never be the case. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly in terms of the time it takes to make those trips, it makes so many of them, um, having so many different barriers between agencies makes many trips just uncompetitive to do on transit overall. Um, and the result is, you know, many of our the billions that we're spending on new, new projects are not, are not leading to the types of uh, trip reductions that we want to see. So the vision that we want to see, and we've done a lot of maps, you know, part of our advocacy is creating bold visions of, of what we want the future to be to really inspire and motivate members of the public to step up and ask for this type of change. So this is a, the vision map that we've created for the nine county Bay Area showing what transit could look like if we put all of our high frequency lines in one in one network if we planned it out in a logical way, connecting our, our local bus services, our regional services, our regional rail, 
um, and didn't think of just about agency boundaries, but think about the network that we want to have overall. So that network, our vision of a regional a connected network is one that's strategically planned at the regional scale to actually work as a system um, where transit agencies, and there may continue to be many of them, they're, we're not, you know, we don't need to necessarily merge all the agencies into one to achieve this vision, but where those transit agencies, um, you know, they do things in a consistent way so that the seams are invisible to the user. Um, but that requires that there are certain standards is, and it requires certain uh, types of institutions that can oversee that standardization of certain aspects of the transit experience, including service quality, you know, routes, fares, schedules, wayfinding, the signage that you see, the, the way that information is displayed to customers to be as reliable and as simple as possible. Someone needs to be in charge, basically, if, if multiple agencies are going to do, thing in a, do, do, uh, do things in a, in a common customer focused way. And lastly, it's important to acknowledge that more funding is needed for more service overall. We can, you know, we can do, we can make improvements by making things more consistent and easier. But at the end of the day, if a bus only comes every half an hour or every hour, that's that's not a very convenient service for people who rely on transit. So having more funding to run more hours of service and have buses and trains come more often is is a another essential. Uh, an additive part of, of how we, you know, make transit the, the preferred way of getting around. So I don't want to suggest here that we can do all these, to create these efficiencies without more funding. We absolutely also need new, more, new funding. But I think it's a compelling case to ask for more funding from the public when you have this clear vision of connectivity um, that, that, that presents a really uh, 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 powerful uh, value proposition to the public who, who we're in California, we need to ask to, to approve funding for, for transit service. And uh, of course, you know, just the preview of the extension of this map down to Santa Cruz, uh, you know, that you'll see here that we've, we've begun to extend this down. So I'll go into this later in the second half of the presentation, but uh, we are, we, I would love to see this, uh, this, this approach, you know, extended to uh, allow for seamless travel between between Santa Cruz and the Bay Area because so many people do that currently. There's so much travel and, and traffic and challenges around around those connections currently. And uh, you know, there's we often hear in the uh, you know about you know people who are skeptical say, well, but the Bay Area is so big and so so spread out, and there's so many different you know, there's bodies of water and there's uh, different um, different small cities or medium sized cities. Um, you know, there are many examples in, cer certainly there are challenges here in the Bay Area, there's many different levels of government, we're very balkanized in many ways, but, you know, we've looked at examples from around the world, and we know that there are regions that are just as fragmented as we are and have many of the same geographical challenges and are extremely spread out with many agencies and municipalities, and they're doing much better, and, and we, you know, one example shown here is the Greater Frankfurt region in uh, Germany which, uh, you know, similar population, you know, more municipalities, more cities, more transit agencies, 160 transit operating companies in compared to so just a few, a mere 27 in the Bay Area. Um, they, since creating, you know, the governance and fair integration reforms in the early 90s, they've seen a 60% growth uh, of transit ridership between 1996 and 2017 in comparison to just 16% growth in the Bay Area during that same period. And they now currently have, you know, a triple the mode share of transit. 19% of all trips are taken on transit in comparison to just about six in the San Francisco Bay Area. So uh, we think that with, with these policy reforms, uh, we can do much better and, and, uh, and really many of these European regions are, are uh, great examples for how you achieve a seamless system, even when you have many different levels of government, many different institutions and a lot of complexity. So the three initiatives that we focus on um, at Seamless um, is our, our right now our a campaign to integrate fares uh, specifically so that it's so the, the amount that you pay is simple and affordable and really encourages transit use. And that's a big barrier right now. We have a we have an effort focused on creating a network manager for the Bay Area. Uh, really a, an institution that has the mandate and authority to actually integrate all forms of transit in our region. 
And then we have a third campaign to actually get the funding that we need to, you know, over the longer, medium and longer term to actually run more service, you know, to, to have more for operations that is going to, again, in combination with these two other policies, uh, be able to really transform the attractiveness of, of public transit for riders and, and make, it, make it a much more convenient way of getting around. So on the, um, the network manager piece, uh, just a little bit more about this uh, specific concept, uh, which, which is that, you know, we need to have in the Bay Area, we need to have uh, an entity that actually is accountable for the system as a whole. Um, that um, that uh, oversees certain key functions of the system that are those that are listed here under this first image include including long range planning, fair policy, service standards, schedules, customer experience, branding. You know, being able to make that those aspects of the of the transit system seamless and logically connected. Um, and you know, individual transit agencies can continue to oversee you know a, a range of functions. And we know that this can be done while recognizing that we have diverse local funding sources. We have many different, you know, we might continue to have many operators that make a lot of local decisions. Mm -hmm. um, the, the fare integration piece, uh, so we created this map a uh, couple years ago to really try to get people to imagine how, if we had a single integrated fare structure, a zone-based fare structure for the Bay Area, how that would change how much you would pay for transit and how it might cause you to think differently about where you're going. So this, this is a, a simple zone-based fare structure where essentially you go, you count the number of zones that you go and it's basically $1 extra per zone. And uh, you, it doesn't matter whether you take BART and Caltrain and a bus to get there or three buses or a ferry and a bus, uh, you basically are just more or less being charged by the distance that you're going. And as long as if you're going, you know, any within two zones, uh, one or two zones, it's it's basically a local fare. It's basically two dollars and twenty cents. So it, it doesn't change. It doesn't make local travel any more expensive, but it really makes a big difference for trips um, that might be not local that that are regional in nature, and helps just uh, assure you know a, a rider that they're going to get the best deal no matter which way they go. Um, and this is an example of a like a trip from Redwood City down to San Jose that right now the current fare for doing that trip by using Caltrain and BTA would be ten dollars and twenty cents. So with a you know whereas if we were to apply a common fare structure, our zone based system, this this would be uh, much closer to what Bart it would cost if you were to take Bart on this trip if Bart actually went between these two locations. Um, and any times of any types of discounts that we would offer could be done in a standardized way. So that it isn't, you get at this amount of discount if you're a student in this agency and, and this amount if you're a senior at that agency, we can have a, a common set of discounts that make things easier for people to understand. So uh, I'll skip, this is a, a timeline. Of, I, will, I won't uh, go into this in detail, but basically we're, we're, we've been working to, uh, uh, to bring about some legislation over the next couple of years uh, but through working on these three initiatives. And we, our hope is that uh, you know, within the next two or three years, through a combination of legislation, policy changes, and, and ultimately a, a ballot measure in 2024 in the Bay Area, we can, we can, we can have these, uh, the progress in these key initiatives that really set us up for changing in trajectory of transit use in the Bay Area and get us on that positive trajectory of growing use instead of stagnating use. And then the very last thing before I pause for questions, if there are any, um, is uh, so a piece of specific piece of legislation that I wanted to highlight that you may have heard of if you if you've heard of us before you've been watching is uh, something is a bill that we have in Sacramento right now called the Seamless Transit Transformation Act or SB 917 with Senator Josh Becker. Um, basically, what this piece of legislation does is it sets deadlines for our, our region to um, deliver on certain aspects of integration uh, uh, that have been discussed for the past two years through a regional initiative called the Blue Ribbon Transit Recovery Task Force. Um, so that task force, uh, you know, identified the need to develop a common integrated fare structure and introduced free transfers between services. It identified the need to create a connected network service plan uh, for how routes should connect in the future. It identified the need for uh, a common transit mapping and wayfinding system for our region. 
and also the need for standards for real-time data so that you know real-time arrival information is a, available you know across all of our, our region in a common format. Um, so this bit what this bill does it is actually requires that our region deliver on these four components that we've already agreed to but that we know can be delayed by unless there's clear you know deadlines for doing it and, and any one transit agency in our region can hold up progress if they decide that you know they're, they they want to drag their feet on implementing one of these policies so this really attaches these deadlines to the allocation of funding to the to the transit agencies uh, within our region and we're hopeful this will make it through um, our our the state legislature so far there's there's no formal opposition so um, that would be a really great uh, step for the Bay Area and we hope maybe a model for the rest of California if this uh, piece of legislation passes. So I will pause there in case there are any questions on the first part of my presentation before I go into the, the Santa Cruz specific stuff. I'm not seeing any raised hands um, or, uh, oh wait, a Adrian has a raised hand and Adrian, uh, I'm going to uh, I'll permit you to speak if you'd like to uh, go ahead and ask your question, please. Thank you, Barry, hi, Ian. Um, yeah, I just, uh, you made a comment earlier in your presentation, I just wanted to, um, emphasize that it's really critical that um, we move to a transit system that is attractive to those um, that in the industry they call quote unquote choice riders. And what mm -hmm. that means is not that they're better people or anything like that. It, it, in the industry, choice rider is someone who is choosing to use transit because it's actually for them a better option. And um, too often um, transit services uh, especially bus services are run by people that are concerned with coverage and so routes meander around and they do not uh, the system design does not value people's time and they don't really prioritize or care about that it takes too long to transfer and get from point a to point b and so you wind up with it's a self-fulfilling prophecy you end up with most of our bus transit agencies i you know i know sam transit is true and i believe the majority of the bay area um Bus ridership is largely composed um, of people that um, have no other option, um, transit dependents, in other words. And so um, they're sort of a captive audience. And so, you know, uh, they can sort of be taken for granted, if you will, a little bit more than someone who has a, a car waiting for them in the driveway. So it's really critical. If we want to be like Germany, uh, which is, um, I am German, and I spent a lot of time um, mm -hmm. gallivanting around Germany and, and understanding their uh, what they call Verkehrsverbund, which is really the vision that Ian, you're laying out, essentially, it sounds like. Those, those folks, um, including in management, know, either you know, frequently use transit or know what it means to actually be um, a choice rider. And so they, they understand and cater more toward, um, you know, without, with, without short, short changing those who are dependent, but, but they have a system that, that really does um, uh, have significant value to those who have a BMW or a Porsche sitting in their driveway and they prefer to take the train because it gets them there quicker or with less stress and all of that. So that's a really, really critical element that um, in America uh, needs to needs to be uh, more emphasized uh, all over America and especially in the Bay Area. Thanks. Thanks, Adrian. Thanks, Adrian. Yeah. I, I agree and I just would, would add that I think that's one of the reasons why I think the, the, the fact that, that so much of the transit system just isn't competitive with driving has been, I think in the studies that I've read uh, about the causes of ridership declines in recent years and particularly in, in Southern California. Um, it's because when, people, when people's incomes are great enough that they can buy a car, they do. Mm. And so it's sort of like if service is so bad that, you know, the moment that people can afford to not take it, you know, they, they won't, um, then there's, then it, that's like a recipe for declining ridership, assuming that incomes are so steadily going up, uh, you know, which, you know, hopefully they are, although that's not always the case. But I think, um, I think we can't be, I think the, the philosophy of just, uh, of course, we need to serve those who depend on transit. I think no one's debating whether, you know, whether we should continue to do that. Of course, it's like very important to do that. But we need to be thinking forward to capturing more of the market because that's a shrinking, the transit dependent is a sort of shrinking market of transit. And 
that sort of leads to a, a slow death spiral if, if we're not restructuring service to be more competitive, um, to, be, to be it's, attracting, yeah, choice riders. So. Yeah. And so, so Ian, right, in this area, it's, it's, it's no secret that housing costs are insane. And so we are gentrifying. And so the, the number, the, the transit dependent population, those who cannot afford or have a car, um, I, I, would, I would venture to say is probably shrinking. And the, the very dynamic you just described is that as soon as people get a car, they abandon transit. Well, what you're in essence saying, as soon as they convert from being transit dependent to being a quote choice rider, meaning they do have a car available to them, they abandon transit, and that that they right choose there, not to take transit. Yeah, right. Exactly. So that's that's the indictment. That's the very problem. I think I'm trying to to mm -hmm. um, to highlight here, and in Germany, um, and and in places where transit really works well, uh, you know, it's not just the the people who have to take transit. It's literally the quote unquote elites and the very well paid people who have a couple cars in their driveway and they still have to take transit because it's the better choice. And so that is that is a mindset that um, is 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 lacking here. I, I, I feel in, in much of the United States, even here in the Bay Area, the way transit is designed, there's often the thought, well, you know, um, that, that uh, people that can drive will and we're just going to cater to those that, you know, um, whether it's on purpose or not, that, that have no other choice. Mm -hmm. thank, thank you, Adrian. Uh, we have another question in, in chat from Linda, which uh, a common and question, comment and question. I think public transportation has a negative connotation in our culture for many reasons. How do you see that changing so that, so it again becomes a, a word of collective desirable choice? Yeah, I think, um, well, I think, fundamentally the experience of taking it has to be i think what you know there's there's a stigma associated with public transit and then there's people's actual experience you right. know so i think if you never take public i mean that there's like the first thing is is maybe something that you know a robust marketing campaign could address <laughs> you know but i think more importantly um i think people's experience, you know, if you use transit, if you attempt to use transit and it's a terrible, confusing, stressful experience, um, you get lost, you don't feel like you're treated like a, you know, you're not, you're treated like your time matters yes. because, you know, the some very obvious sign was not put up or some announcement wasn't made. You know, that that is a real, um, I think that's part of why public transit has a bad reputation. Um, I certainly sometimes often feel that way. And I, yet I still come, keep coming back to public transit. So I think I think putting the customer at the center of, of service and really uh, is part of resuscitating the, the reputation of public transit. And, and I think a number of agencies across the continent have been successful at doing that and really being, um, you know, being, uh, being able to, you know, change the impression of it. But I, I, you know, there's some people who will just never see public transit as a viable option. And I, I don't, we probably don't need to even focus on people who are just simply would never ever consider it. Um, but I think by putting out service that maybe once they might try um, that that can really, if they have a positive experience, it might cause them to be more likely to try it. You know, if they try to train or now they might try a bus. Um, so I think we, we can really focus on improving the experience and, and um, is, is the core of that issue. Yeah. Well, well, thank you for that answer. It, it, uh, the cultural aspects of, of public transit here are, are profound. Of course, uh, it's an American thing, the, the dream of the car. I, I've uh, my own question. It, it has, have, have you or other transit planners tracked much the correlation between low gas prices and <laughs> and and you know the the drop in in ridership and i i know i've seen unfortunate articles that seem to uh connect greater numbers of people owning cars with with a, a, a more successful economy uh i've seen the i've seen you know editorials and uh, and, and articles in for, for Los Angeles saying, hey, things are wonderful because more and more people are driving. More and more households have a car. Wow. Uh, what what can you say to to fuel prices? And are there any projections that maybe with the higher fuel prices, would people be more likely to use transit if we can make it available? 
Yeah, I, I know there is some. There are studies that say that there is an effect that gas prices have, but it's it's only to a point, right? So it's like if if there's no viable transit option that that is convenient and and time competitive, it doesn't matter how expensive gas is. It's just not a choice. There's no transit option for you to switch to. Right. So when there's a transit option, I think there you know it, you'll see more of that correlation. But I think a big issue. Uh, it, a, a much larger issue is is uh, is the quality of the service, and that's that's keeping you know that's that's creating the ceiling for what transit ridership can grow toward. Um, and you know we can also price gas differently. You know, obviously we have the policy tools to be right. charging you know for road you know gas uh, you know gas or car prices. So those those. But I don't. I don't think the solution. I I support making it more affordable to take transit and, and in some cases more expensive to drive. But I don't think that's a very good policy solution without providing quality. You know, public transit. You need to. You need to give people a good op option. Otherwise, you're just punishing people and you're not giving them any alternatives. Um, that's what it feels like sometimes around here. <laughs> <laughs> no, no rail. So, so look, I, I think our next, I don't see more questions at this moment. And, and so I'm excited to invite you to move to part two of your presentation. Great, all right, so I'll move right along. Uh, close some of these windows here, for the chat, okay. So uh, looking a little bit at, so I'm admittedly, um, you know, I live in San Francisco. I've gone to Santa Cruz, visited Santa Cruz many times um, over the past 15 years. I am not an expert in Santa Cruz County and have very limited uh, experience using using Santa Cruz Metro. But you know, over the past couple of weeks, I've been learning more about it and and talking um, and you know doing some of my own research. And so you know, I, a couple observations just around the current transit in Santa Cruz County. Um, you know, obviously, one strength is that <laughs> you don't really have this fragmentation issue because there's one agency that really is for the entire county, um, which is, I think, a, a, an opportunity um, for, especially as you consider rail service. Um, you know, I think transit ridership overall is uh, is not bad considering for the, for the size of the population and for the size of the region. And I think it, that's connected to the fact that there's a, you know, university, a strong demand from university students and, and other populations. So uh, there's, there's a base to build off of, certainly. Um, but definitely challenges are, you know, that I've seen that the ridership has been going down in recent years and the, and the, the amount of service has been going down. So uh, that's always disappointing to see. And that's usually a big factor in, in declining ridership is if there's fewer buses running, of course, fewer people are going to use them. Mm -hmm. I don't know what the cause of those service cuts have been. Uh, this is prior to COVID, of course. I, I, I imagine there's been there's further challenges because of COVID. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's a small overall population. Um, and my observation is relatively little gr limited growth is planned, which does, which is a, you know, maybe that could change. Maybe there'll be more, uh, more, more growth planned that, that certainly can help with, you know, the case for building more transit and improving transit use. So, and, and, and land uses can be challenging in certain parts of the, of, of the county, but, you know, all, all regions certainly have their land use challenges. So um, now I, so I, I started by, doing a little bit of research on a couple of comparable, you know, uh, some other regions and areas where there is rail service that I thought were maybe relevant to thinking as I thought about how rail service could be structured um, and how it could evolve in, in Santa Cruz County and on the Santa Cruz branch corridor. So one example that I um, um, know about is uh, that it seems is an interesting uh, one to look to is the Kitchener-Waterloo region in Canada. So this is a small city um, about 65 miles from Toronto. Um, Toronto is a region of, you know, about 7 million. So it's kind of a similar distance away from uh, Toronto as, as Santa Cruz is from the Bay Area. Um, it is bigger. It's a, you know, Kitchener-Waterloo has about 400,000 people, but um, they just opened a, a new light rail line. And it's actually the smallest region in North America to, to have its own light rail system. Um, that just opened in 2019. It's a 12 mile long segment. Um, and it was introduced alongside, you know, a robust BRT system and, you know, done in very much in concert with the bus system that was there. 
Um, and it, it has the, you know, the service that it was introduced was on opening day. It had 10 to 15 minute frequencies throughout the day um, and then up to eight to 10 minute frequencies during the peak. And the ridership, yeah, it opened in 2019. So it only had a few months of you know, normal service prior to the pandemic happening, but it did, it was, it had already attracted about uh, almost 20,000 daily riders, um, which is pretty good, I think, um, in comparison to many systems. Um, and I, I know it's it's building its way back there, um, you know, due to the pandemic. So um, these are images from, of how the, you know, you can see here the, uh, on the upper right-hand corner, they picked a corridor that, you know, really is the primary, uh, you know, transit route in the region that was well served by buses and, and really making it rail services, expanding the capacity and the reliability of that corridor. They very intentionally restructured the bus service when they introduced this rail service to be, uh, to be maximizing those connections. And they set up the fare system very intentionally to be integrated so that it's really the same fare that you pay, you don't pay an extra fare to, to switch from bus to train back to bus again. You can use them in any combination um, and, and it, it works seamlessly. Uh, I think that's partly to, and, and these are some policies that they, you know, they very intentionally introduced with that rail service. You know, it's called ION is the name of the light rail. So seamless connections, you know, the, the introduction of new express routes, um, you know, focusing on supporting a grid pattern to make transfers as, as frequent and easy as possible, a single fare structure, and then also looking at the shelters and some of the aspects of the customer experience to make it more comfortable to really be a part of a holistic way of building transit ridership in the region. Another project that uh, seemed quite relevant is uh, also in Canada, these are all Canadian examples. Um, uh, so is the Ottawa, uh, what is, now called the Trillium Line, but when it opened, it was called the O-Train. Um, so this is a train that was opened on, in 2001 on a single track. So there was a single old rail right of way uh, going from downtown Ottawa southward. And they, it was only five stations and it was open kind of as a pilot project. Um, and these, this station you can see here, it's from a few years ago, but like there's not a lot around the station. So the, the land use isn't even necessarily that great. Um, at least it's, it's changed in recent years, but um, it did remarkably well. And it, and it attracted, you know, it made its way up to, I think it's about 20,000 daily riders use this service. Much of it is still just a single track. They have passing tracks at key locations that allows it. Initially it was running at 15 minute service. Um, the stations are quite far apart and slightly different from how the, the, some of the concepts for light rail are planned uh, in, in Santa Cruz. But, um, you know, the, this image shows that it's really part of a, a broader network. So they, they and, and that's one of the reasons why the ridership is so high is, so Ottawa has a really robust bus rapid transit system. All of the blue lines going east, west here are, are, and green are part of their, their BRT network this red, that's the rail line that I was referring to that, that opened up, but it really is connected at both ends. Um, and uh, it, it really relies off of more so the connections to the bus services as the primary driver of ridership rather than um, things that are necessarily within walking distance of the O train stations. Um, so yeah. Some success factors are, you know, there's serving of major destinations, having the good local service frequencies, you know, integrating with the net bus network. And, and over time, these have really attracted more land use intensification, which is a further uh, supported ridership. So those are two services that like run from day one, they ran like 15 minute frequencies all day long. You know, another model uh, that might be, I think, sort of as I think about it more, I think actually might be more apl applicable to an early service concept for the Santa Cruz uh, rail line would be um, uh, more of a commuter commuter focused service initially with with buses integrating to provide all all day service and ramping up service over time. And this is very much the model that is in in the Toronto region at Go Transit, which is the regional transit agency. Um, that also where I used to work, uh, that, that the way that they run uh, bus and rail service in an integrated way. So they, they go transit runs, has buses and trains, 
And this is looking at one specific corridor, just as an example called the barrier ferry corridor. But you can see, you know, it, it, the rail line is in blue. It, there's a number of stations. Um, the schedule is here on the right. So you can see these, each of these, the, the, the system is structured in a, in a way that, uh, you know, there's trains that go in the peak direction when traffic is the worst and that the trains really provide the faster service, you know, compared to driving. They're, they're competitive during the morning going in the southbound direction. And then, but then you see in white, all the, all the white roads here uh, in the schedule are buses. So there are buses running all day long, you know, in both directions. Basically, if you show up at one of these stations, there's either a bus or a train going in both directions all day long. And if you're, if you're going in the peak direction, it'll be a train and therefore it'll be able to carry a lot more people and it'll probably be faster as well. But even if you happen to miss the train or if, you know, you, you can rely, you can, these, these, they make real hubs during all times of the day because they, they, there is always some type of transit service. So the ability for Go Transit to run both buses and trains in an integrated way um, to run those services together, and then also to have the local services that are feeding those stations in an integrated way have really helped Go Transit be a really high performer in North America in terms of building building ridership, but and in a very incremental way, um, and 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 focusing on on you know, starting with one train and adding, adding another training and adding another train as the demand uh, calls for it. And, and now they're in the process of electrifying all of these corridors and double tracking them all. So ultimately they are in the process of converting to a true regional rail system that is two way, all day service, all gonna be on rail, but that will take many years. Um, but even, even the service that's there right now is quite good. And, and a lot of it is, is, is bus service. Um, as a counter example, you know, I think I, I sort of <laughs> my observation and I realize maybe I, this might be somewhat, I don't, you know, I, I observe that like in comparison to those examples, like the smart, the, the example, the, the most recent example of a new rail project that we have here in the Bay Area with the smart system is, is less successful in a number of ways. The ridership is, is quite low, um, but it really duplicated an existing regional bus system. And it's, it's not very integrated with that regional bus system, unlike Go Transit, which I just showed, where you know you logically could be operating Smart and uh, Golden Gate Transit, which goes through along this exact same corridor. You could be running those two, two services in an integrated way with integrated fares and schedules, um, so that you're really providing more frequency. But instead, they all go to different stations. Like the, the Smart stations are not necessarily where the bus stations are. Um, you know, there's some poor connections in particular at like Larkspur, it doesn't really connect to the ferry. It takes a 15 minute walk to get there. Um, they have service throughout the day, but it's, you know, 30 to 60 minute headways. Um, so, you know, in that sense, it's, it is all day. That's a good thing, but it's, it's unclear. Uh, it doesn't seem to be translating into a lot of use. So um, I think those are all sort of in lessons to be learned from different systems that, and, and now moving towards the actual, you know, the Santa Cruz piece and the, the exercise that I completed. So uh, first I wanted to, just in terms of trying to understand the Santa Cruz network, um, you know, the maps, it's really hard to understand the Santa Cruz network. And, and I think this is just wanted to make a comment on, you know, the, 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 the website, the way that information is displayed to customers online when they're trying to plan their trip is, is is currently a problem and when an area that you know that alone could be really uh, improved upon i know i know there's some new website uh planning tools in the works but it, it's very difficult to know where transit takes you when this is a, the sort of the way that you are presented the network as you're trying to understand uh, uh you know if you're an occasional user if you use it all the time then maybe this makes sense to you but if you're a new user that's thinking about using it or if you haven't used it in a while and you don't know where all the routes go this is a really difficult uh, interface to navigate. After doing some digging, I did finally find some more easy to understand maps. Um, I think the the work, of course, on the Santa Cruz branch line. You know, I've been I've reviewed some of the studies that have been uh, created, and I'm really pleased to see that this is being considered as part of like one of three corridors that is really you know connecting the east and the west, and and trying to. I think it's really important to be planning service in a way across these three corridors. The the sequel, and I'm going to get the pronunciation of some of these. Is that is that right, Barry? Sokol. Sokel. Sokel. Sokel Drive, 
um, the the branch line and then Highway One as being you know those the three main east west corridors. Right. So here we are. So this is this is this this image is really beginning to show how you know our our vision map really is the the logic behind it is that we did for the Bay Area is identifying these high frequency services across the different modes. Um, and so we've begun to, to, to show what that looks like. If we extend that to Santa Cruz, I will zoom in so you can see more closely, but really trying to create the basis of the skeleton of a, of a frequent rapid transit network that what you just show up on any of these lines and it, there's gonna be something that comes relatively soon. Um, so what does that look like? So this, this is kind of an approximation, it's not perfect of what transit service is currently like uh, connecting you know, downtown San Jose and Santa Cruz. You've got the Highway 17 corridor. It's actually only probably once an hour or so. Uh, you have a service along Highway 1 during much of the day. And then you have a couple of high quality routes um, you know, around the university and, and then within Watsonville. Um, you don't have any connection at all between Gilroy and Watsonville. I was surprised to learn it's impossible. There's no transit that currently exists there. So with the extension of, of Caltrain southward from Gilroy uh, with stations at Pajaro and, and Castroville, you know, there's this opportunity for the coast, uh, the, the Santa Cruz branch line to really connect at Pajaro and, and to connect at key hubs and, uh, at, you know, uh, Aptos, Watsonville and, and uh, downtown Santa Cruz are, I, you know, just seem to be really, really important places for these to connect. And really thinking about how the, the, the service, the local service can be improved on, uh, on these connecting routes to feed into these stations um, to really form the basis of a, of a coherent network that a rider can look at and sort of understand and have some confidence that it, if they're on any of these transit corridors, they'll be able to get to any other part of the, of the subregion. And thinking about this is a subtle color change. This is going from gray to green and orange. Thinking about over time after from a, a commuter rail service that might be only during the peak times, like that Go Transit service that I was talking about. You know, as we have more funding for double tracking or or you know other uh, electrification improvements, we can potentially see that that rail corridor transitioning into a higher quality service that's more frequent all, all throughout the day. Um, so then zooming in a little more closely here and, and just explaining this a little bit more. So here's an, this is sort of the initial concept for how I, I think, you know, you could run rail service along this corridor. Um, again, the gray is the, the peak, you know, thinking about it as initially with, you know, focusing on the peak direction service. Um, you know, during those periods of time when the highway is especially backed up and you may, maybe you don't need as many trains, you just need to uh, you're running you're running focus service that really uh, is competitive competitive with the with the travel the driving time when the traffic is really backed up. Um, oh, and I have some animation here. So here's you know in the morning, for example, you could be the dominant travel direction is is from Watsonville to to downtown Santa Cruz, um, and you know in the evening it would be in the opposite direction. And what you could do again to take that concept from from Toronto is, you know, having ensuring that you're running the bus service between these key corridors uh, all throughout the day. So you're 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 this. Uh, sorry, the first images. The train is really taking the pressure off of the bus services and and, and ensuring that it's it's much more. It's probably fa it is faster because it it doesn't get stuck in traffic. But uh, but by ensuring that that you're continuing to provide regular frequencies of buses along Sokol and Highway 1 between these key hubs, um, you can ensure that at these key points, there's always going to be a bus or a train coming, um, especially at Aptos, at, at downtown Santa Cruz and at, and at Watsonville. You know, these three hubs are really, you know, sort of I'm seeing them as really important points uh, for connections. You know, I know, I know that downtown Santa Cruz is not currently, you know, very well connected on the, on the rail alignment, but I just, Looking at looking at this, it does seem that it's really critical to figure out some way of it connecting into downtown, uh, because that is so much that is where all you know so much of the demand is, and all the connections to UC Santa Cruz are going through downtown currently. So to really make, I think to to me that should be a really high priority for the for the rail line is figuring out how how what what alignment makes sense for connection to downtown. Um, 
And then the long-term concept, again, this is a subtle change, but again, thinking about going from a commuter service to an all-day type service uh, along these corridors and really having, you know, really a high quality local network in particular, all the way from UC Santa Cruz to, to Aptos, uh, you know, the rail becoming more of a, uh, less of a less of a commute based service, but really more of a all, all type of um, all day service. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, from Aptos to Watsonville, it, it might be less frequent, you might have some trains terminating in Aptos and some going all the way to Watsonville, Watsonville. Uh, and Pajaro, depending on how much service there is, you know, going all the going to Gilroy and connecting uh, down to Salinas. Quickly, very very briefly here, I I'm almost done here. I just did a little bit of thinking again on on that's the, those are the service concepts, but I thinking also about like the other aspects of what makes transit seamless. And, and in terms of fares, um, of, I think just as a general principle, I mean, my view would be that the fares on this type of train should be the same as. Uh, on the buses, and if we we developed a zone-based concept for our fair vision map that I shared before, um, so I showed you that that image of this. This is what it looks like um, uh, in the colors are, are are how it would look like on a real map. But if you were to extend those same sized zones, which are about seven miles uh, in uh, di uh, in diameter. To, to Santa Cruz all the way from Gilroy and from the Bay Area, what you'd see here is it's basically an extra dollar to go one more zone. Mm -hmm. And the way this is structured that, you know, one to two zones, the first two zones you go is sort of considered the local fare. So, which in this map, it's 220, I think it's $2 in Santa Cruz. So this is a bit higher than what it currently is in Santa Cruz. But you could imagine that um, if this was the, this was part of a, the rollout of a rail system, the, the movement towards this type of common fare structure, it would it would make it a, a sort of more transparent fare of, of how, you know, of, of going different distances that that isn't too much of a big jump if you're if you're going a little bit further. Um, it's also cheaper, I think, currently than it what it costs to take this the bus across to, to, San, to San Jose from from Santa Cruz, which is, I think, seven dollars. Mm -hmm. So those are the prices from Santa Cruz, and then this would be the prices from Watts, if, from a trip originating in Watsonville, how that logic would work. Um, and potentially you could extend this all to Salinas and to other places as well. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, recognizing people are going to take a combination of buses and trains to get where they need to go. And, and this just type of common system would give people the confidence that they're not going to get ripped off just because they happen to, you know, use a different a train instead of a bus for one type of their what when one part of their journey and then very lastly on branding i mean i think personally like yeah the, another component of success for the project would be you know branding the train and the buses as part of the same system and i actually think santa cruz metro has a great brand right now so i would say that should become the brand for the transit system and any brand that you develop for the rail is really a sub brand of of the of the system as a whole and Mm -hmm. thinking about how you can have a family of brands, Metro Rail, Metro Bus, maybe some kind of Express Bus, Metro Express Bus, um, can really, uh, you know, help it, help market the system as an entire system. Again, unlike SMART, where you're saying, well, take SMART, but you're not saying take transit, any ticket, take, take Golden Gate or SMART, we don't care, whatever is most convenient for you, you can really be saying, take transit, uh, and the rail system is part of, uh, part of the entire system. Um, I think those those would be important parts of you know creating the, the perception of it of a seamless system and the ease of use for customers. So this is my last slide here, uh, just in summary, some I think some success factors um, to to reflect upon. You know, first, don't create. I would say don't create a new agency just for the rail project. Um, I would say if needed, if Santa Cruz Metro is not currently optimally structured, I would I would really focus on fixing it rather than. And making it fit for the purpose of, of delivering a rail project and the and the bus system it operates, rather than creating a separate entity. Because the moment you create a separate entity, you're going to be it's it it becomes very very difficult to have the two systems uh, you know work in concert and to be making uh, system wide decisions. Um, I think structuring the service initially to be time competitive as being a really important uh, way of initially attracting people to the service serving major destinations. And I think a real focus should be on figuring out a way of having the service serve, um, you know, the, the, the downtown uh, bus terminal if possible. Um, having seamless connections at some of those major hubs where the bus networks and the rail networks come together. Um, 
um, making it easier to explain to people and understand. And I think through the mapping, through the branding and design of all of these components really deliberately, uh, it can be presented as a really simple system to access. And, and um, uh, I think that's gonna be important for, for building ridership on day one and then attracting a lot of the visitors and the choice riders that, that yeah, aren't gonna be dependent on this, but are maybe interested in taking it if it looks approachable and easy to use. Um, obviously integrate fares between the rail and the bus. Um, as you think about funding operations, really make sure you're funding both the rail operations and the bus operations together and not mm -hmm. having one compete with the other, you know, having to dip into bus operations funds to keep rail operations going, I think, to build a case to voters that you wanna fund both, you wanna increase service on both bus and rail would be a really compelling way of making sure that you're not, you're not gonna be accidentally, uh, you know, diverting bus funding uh, uh, to, in order to keep rail service going if your ridership projections don't meet what they, they are supposed to be. And then branding the whole transit network as a network. So all of this requires that you preserve the ability to keep transit on the rail right away, of course. So uh, that goes without saying, but um, anyway, those are, these are, that's, that's the end of my presentation here. And I, uh, sorry if I went a few minutes over here, but happy to take any questions or have a discussion if you want, if you'd like. Not at all. We, uh, uh, Ian, thank you so much. And, and we're not in a hurry to end on, on any particular time, time point. Um, the last uh, presentation went a full 90 minutes. And, and uh, to the extent that you're available and we're, we're interested, we can go as long as we want. Um, I want to, I, I, yes to your last point, we have to keep we have to keep transit on the rail right away. And if we don't have the rail, if we, if we don't keep the rail, the rail line there and uh, permitted as it is today, and if we don't defeat Measure D, uh, the initiative that would uh, seek to remove the middle of it, we'll, we'll be in trouble. My favorite point in your summary is trains, buses, bikes, and pedestrians are all one network. And um, that, that I hope would be part of the branding and, and all of your points are great, but I wanted to use that bill of point to go to Bob Arco's question that's in the Q&A section here. What systems uh, represent, uh, you know, I think what, what systems out there that we might look into or be familiar with, what systems represent a benchmark for thoughtful integration of expanding personal mobility options? While trains can be relatively easy to configure to accommodate bikes, e-bikes, scooters, et cetera, I'm not aware of buses that offer similar affordances. It seems to me a rider-centric model of seamless service would need to overcome this challenge. Interesting. Well, um, on the specific matter of bu buses on, sorry, bikes on buses, um, Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I certainly know there's various types of racks. I bring my bike on a bus all the time uh, here in San Francisco. You know, racks are, you know, they they do require that you lift your bike, you know, and you have to be yeah. strong enough to, to, to use it. It's not the easiest thing to use. Um, and certainly, yeah, trains with level boarding, anything with level boarding and, and, and enough space um, to actually store a bike, which is, you know, I think space is a problem on a bus to bring it in the bus because you're, you're potentially yeah. taking space away from passengers. So I, you know, I think, I think, I think having, having options for people, having those racks, if people want to use them, I, I don't, I'm not aware of a especially great, you know, bus uh, system for, that makes it, that overcomes these challenges with, with bikes. But I think having a, wonderful bike share network. I feel like it's been kind of transformative having a, a bike share network uh, and, and plentiful local options such that it really doesn't, it means that I don't need to bring a bike in so many cases, at least here within the Bay Area, right. because there are bike share pods. So I think that's part of like not needing to, to take your own bike on a bus, but rather having uh, thoughtfully placed, you know, first mile, last mile options available at these key hubs at the train stations and at some of the key, uh, the bus uh, networks. And I think, um, you know, I think that's uh, Swiss, I, I would say, you know, having recently dived very deeply into the Swiss transit system, I know they're doing a lot of really incredible work thinking thoughtfully about locating first mile lot, like car share, bike share, scooter share, 
in a very highly integrated way at all of their rail stations throughout, you know, throughout the country, really trying to uh, make sure that someone coming off of a train or coming off of a bus has, you know, all of that, you know, like a, a lot of non-automotive options. And if they even need to use a car, they've got a public car share option right there. They don't need to have their own personal vehicle. So I think having, again, having it overseen by the level of government that has a broad mobility mandate, Santa Cruz Metro, hopefully in Santa Cruz or in the Bay Area, the, the network manager that we hope we could create um, and having them with the clear mobility mandate, I think is the ultimately what's needed to be able to be thoughtful about, uh, about doing this in a highly organized way. Yeah, well, well, well th thank you for that. You know, it, uh, our last speaker, uh, my, Michael Seth Wexler, talked about the, the Danish model versus the Dutch model. The Danish model being bikes that are fit on trains and the Dutch model being more about uh, bike, bike share programs and bike rentals at each end of the trip. So hmm. there's probably some, some combination in there. And, and, you know, there's no escaping uh, zip cars and Uber and Lyft is a potentially a part of this uh, solution mm -hmm. for some users. Uh, and, and, and so, you, you, you know, we, it's, it's always a yes and. All, all things can, can be part of a network, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, I've, got a, I've got a comment from Linda that I'll, I'll, I'll just go ahead and, and read. Um, and uh, Linda uh, Wilson says, I really like the summary. We have in the past looked at, the, at a connection both to Metro and, and also to UCSC. Uh, UCSC more of a challenge due to the elevation change. Unfortunately, in our area, competition has been stoked between uh, buses and rail, bikes and rail, and rail and highway improvements, uh, like like these you know three different <laughs> factions that are warring with one another. Uh, and she appreciates how you how uh, appreciate your your point of view on how to address any. Uh, she would appreciate your point of view on how to address any of these issues. There are the highway wideners, just give us more lanes. There's the, the don't take our, but you know, your, your train's gonna impact our buses and your, or your train's gonna take away our bike goodness. Uh, how do you, how do you recommend we might best address these, uh, these issues? Um, yeah, I, I, I think, I, I think they, they they need to be talked about in the same conversation. I think I, I I'm not sure. Um, I can totally see how that happens, and I think it's a it's a it's a common thing that probably happens everywhere. But I think it's it's an easy it's an easy. I think it's it's why having a starting place of a of a clear vision is really important, because without a clear vision that is based on mobility. I think it is easy to say if your vision only is rail, you know, if your vision is only, you know, one thing, and it's not just broad mobility, it's not, it's not freedom, and it's not uh, having options, then you're going to say, well, your project is going to come at the cost of my project, or your your form of mobility is going to come at the cost of my preferred form of mobility. So having, I think, that having advocacy focus on not just one mode, but really mobility as, in general, and then the specific, the specific modes, trains, buses, and transit as being, you know, all complementary ingredients toward, you know, better mobility, more sustainable mobility. I think that's been, I think, an ongoing thing for Seamless Bay Area. I just was reflecting upon advocacy is having mm -hmm. having everyone be able to see within your vision something for them. Um, so um, I don't know. I don't know if that's useful for for Santa Cruz, but. Uh, I would, I think, to the extent that you can articulate the the goals of the rail project as part of a, as a part of a seamlessly integrated mobility network that is affordable, and that re reduces our reliance on vehicles that that is consistent with a trail network, which I think you're already doing, but uh, you know, I think I think that just uh, you you can't say it enough times. People are always going to probably take issue with it, but I think if you say it enough times, hopefully people actually start to believe you <laughs> sure. uh, and you invest in all of them. I think ultimately you need to be investing in all of these things. You can't just be asking for money for one thing. You have to be asking for money for, for all of the things um, that, that 
that can make this a reality. That that is uh, uh, that is helpful. Thank you. And it is uh, as we say sometimes, just we need in all of the above uh, solutions, all of the above. Um, mm -hmm. Linda adds another question. How do you see the benefits of walking as a primary mode for accessing transit, bus and rail? Oh, well, certainly that's the ideal way of accessing transit, bus and rail. Um, I, 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 uh, uh, I think that's what most people are walking. I, I think some cyclists are, you know, uh, you know, it's nice. It's a nice nice convenient option but usually i prefer to walk to a bus or a train and not have to bring my bike with me if at all possible yeah. so um uh yeah i think to the extent that investing in the pedestrian infrastructure that provides access to these these this, in, the, these stations is uh maybe that's maybe that's a winning approach to to building the case if you're saying we're going to be upgrading the the pedestrian connections to these rail stations as part of this project it, might be another way of building support for it. I, I think you're right. And we we do, at least in my neighborhood, uh, sometimes pedestrians get the are the last to be considered for some of the safety improvements that we need, so, such as the such as the the kind of the lack of space in some cases, but also just the the predominance of uh, of, of motor vehicle concerns and improvements. So uh, mm -hmm. everything begins with a almost every trip begins with some some degree of walking, a little bit of walking to your car or to your bike. Uh, and Bob Arco adds, uh, that's what Coast Connect was created to represent here in uh, this systemic seamless mobility, a kind of an all, truly all modes working mm -hmm. in a, a, a cohesive way and not in a competitive way. And so we have uh, we have our, our local campaign and effort, uh, coastconnect.org, which we're very proud of. Um, and and so yeah, I want to I want to ask uh, Ian if uh, if your slideshow is something you can make available to to us later. Yep, yep, that, that definitely. Beautiful. And I I'm I'm going to check and see. I don't see other hands raised. It's it's my hope that uh, this presentation and and the uh, prior presentation as well as Thursday's um, presentation by Rod Deridon and and uh, we also had Christina. Uh, Watson from uh, Transportation Agency of Monter Monterey County. That the, the three. This is the third of this week's uh, series on on transportation, and we're going to uh, make these all available by um, YouTube for free. And and uh, uh, I am I'm looking forward to having these these out here. I'm looking forward to um, defeating Measure D. And uh, I'm not, I don't want to be complacent, but I think we, uh, I think uh, enough of us uh, want to see that go down, that it will go down. So with that, Ian, I just want to thank you. Everybody is thanking you in, uh, in, in the chat. And um, let me see if there's any, anything left. No, everybody says thank you. And Ian, uh, I thank you for sure. And on behalf of uh, everyone in Santa Cruz County and future generations, uh, <laughs> thanks for helping us with our, our efforts. Well, thanks for having me. Okay, great. Good luck. And yes. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye.